Okay. All right, it's nine o'clock, so I think we'll uh, get started with the next session here. So thank you all for coming to join us. Uh, hopefully we have a, a topic that uh, everybody here finds of interest. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, building a cloud environment with open networking and software-defined storage technologies. Uh, my name is Paul Speciale. I'm the VP of Product Management for Scality. I'm actually here on behalf of uh, our CTO, Giorgio Regni, who couldn't make the trip. Uh, but I'm fortunate to be joined by uh, Nolan Leek, who's... Uh, Hello. I'm uh, the co-founder of uh, Chemos Networks. So we'll kind of co-present this session here, and uh, we'll kind of take you guys through a little bit of the problem statement and uh, description of the various technologies and how we feel the two uh, combine to make a, a synergy and make life easier. Okay, so as a, a mini agenda, we do want to make this interactive, uh, but we'll kind of set up the talk here with a little bit of... Uh, a couple of slides about the data center, how we would build a big storage system for storing hundreds of terabytes or potentially petabytes of data in an OpenStack environment. And I'll have Nolan talk a little bit about uh, open networking, what it is, what are its key capabilities, and then again, we'll kind of close with uh, some of the advantages and ask you to participate. Um, so I think much of this is very obvious to us, but a, a couple of things I want to throw in. We're obviously trying to build new data center infrastructures based on kind of the technologies that we know the giants are using, right? And that's one of the reasons why OpenStack is around. Um, certainly one of the things it introduces is a lot of variables, right? We, we, we're gonna have lots of different uh, applications hopefully running in OpenStack. That's really sort of the core goal, right? Is to support our businesses uh, so that we can run applications and different kinds of workloads. Uh, that's gonna have a huge bearing on storage infrastructures and on networking infrastructures. Uh, but moreover, one of the things that we believe is, is a problem is that there's lot, lots of disparate uh, management uh, frameworks that are starting to appear. Uh, and we'd like to make that common, right? So one of the approaches here is to make this very open uh, and to be able to leverage kind of common management frameworks, things like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, and all of that. Um, from a storage management perspective, which is what we're focused on, we've certainly seen the cloud impact data storage at scale and also at type. Uh, we're seeing lots of explosion in virtual machines. Uh, that means you need virtual machine storage, you need file storage, you need object storage. Uh, it just creates a big mess, and ultimately one of the things that we feel it results in is an explosion of storage silos. Uh, we'll talk about a solution for managing the big unstructured data. Uh, that is a scale-out, uh, typically addressed now by a scale-out technology, uh, which requires very flexible networking technologies. So that, that's kind of the heart of what we'll talk about. Um, Big storage solutions today, uh, people are certainly very interested in object storage. Uh, in the world of OpenStack, that means Swift, right? So Swift provides uh, the verbs for doing uh, large-scale puts and deletes and, uh, and gets against data uh, stored as objects in the cloud. Uh, but there are competing technologies. There's, of course, Amazon uh, as a growing force. Their e S3 spec uh, is something that we're tracking and a lot of people are embracing. Ultimately, we feel that this drives a big, big uh, increase in complexity of network topology and also for managing these, uh, these infrastructures. Uh, so that's where we feel we can come in with kind of these open uh, platform technologies to really make life simpler. Uh, so I mentioned the fact that distributed storage is now becoming kind of the normal model. Uh, so what does this mean? It means scale out in two dimensions. Uh, I may need my application to talk to various protocol services. Uh, REST protocols are now very common, of course, for uh, accessing big data. Um, that's where Swift comes in, certainly. Uh, but the need to address an incoming larger and larger load uh, may mean that I need to dial up the number of interface servers, the number of protocol servers. Uh, in our model, we call these connectors. They can serve NFS traffic. They can serve uh, REST traffic. Uh, but the key is that I need to be, be able to scale them out as my load grows over time. Uh, very commonly in the Swift model, we have the notion of uh, object storage daemons or storage nodes. Uh, as capacity needs grow, I want to be able to add these incrementally and sort of grow the capacity of my system. And all of that, of course, is glued together by uh, an expandable network fabric. Uh, so what's the heart of a uh, software-defined storage offering is really the intelligent storage services. Uh, this is really the glue, right? So the model these days is I don't want to buy hardware appliances or arrays that embed the, the, uh, the software intel or the intelligence for storage management. I really want data durability services to be in the software. 
I want things that route around failures when they occur. If a drive fails, it shouldn't be an abnormal condition, right? Uh, in the old world of RAID controllers, as soon as a drive failed, some administrator received an alert, and you had to go hurry in there and, uh, and repair and replace the disk. Uh, that goes away now, so we'll, we'll talk about how we do self-healing uh, in the face of these types of failures. And then, of course, growth should happen without disruption. I want to be able to add resources on the fly. Uh, the service remains available. And moreover, I want flexibility of choice. I want to be able to choose what uh, hardware I run on in terms of both the server side, the storage side, and also the network platform. Okay? And ultimately, uh, certainly users want to be able to manage these things over APIs. Uh, so that they can monitor the health, the performance, and also to do management, to do provisioning uh, of these systems over APIs uh, from all their common tools. Okay, so with that said, uh, there are some challenges in distributed storage. Certainly management is one of them, uh, but the two I want to point out that are very, very relevant to the choice of networking technology that you select are really failure domains and data proximity. Uh, so these are data placement considerations. So as you move to a distributed storage system, uh, you start having considerations about where you place the data. Uh, so again, this isn't the model of having a RAID controller that manages eight or 10 drives, and all of those drives are local. Uh, what we're doing instead now is taking a big file or a big object and distributing it across the system. And there's really two considerations that drive that. The first is the notion of a failure domain. I want to be able to take either uh, replication chunks, multiple copies of a file, and distribute those across my servers, my disks, my racks, and ultimately I might even have multiple data centers that I need to think about placing these, these chunks across. Um, modern systems um, cu currently support things like replication schemes that are variable, so that lets me dial in how many copies of an object I want to store. Uh, more sophisticated ones implement erasure coding, right? So this is a variable parity scheme where Rather than storing multiple instances of, a, of an object, I'm actually doing a parity scheme, and I'm breaking the object up into chunks, uh, storing some data chunks and some parity chunks across these different failure domains. So in the example here, if I have four, four data chunks, each representing a replica, I want to ensure that they're all on different servers, on different drives, and potentially on different racks, right? Because the racks might be a failure domain of their own, uh, given how power is distributed. Okay, so that's dispersal of the data so that I can ensure that if I have a failure, I'm not impacting multiple copies or multiple chunks at one time. Uh, but that fights against the other need that I have, which is data proximity, right? So in order to get performance, I need to be able to access the data rather quickly, right? And this usually means that one of my protocol servers, a REST server that's fe fetching data, needs to be fairly close in terms of number of network hops to the actual chunks. So we'd like this to be bounded, right? And this becomes a problem as I scale out the number of racks. Uh, traditional topologies really start uh, increasing the number of uh, hops that I need to, across, to cross in order to get the data. Uh, so maybe with that, I can hand it to Nolan with some comments about the networking uh, side of this. Thank you. <coughs> so before we get into how we solve those challenges that, that Paul brought up, uh, I'll give a brief overview of Cumulus Linux. Uh, who, who here has uh, heard of Cumulus? Okay, who here has used the product? Okay, fewer, so I'll, I'll get into how it works a bit. Um, so, you know, we're, we're best known for uh, open networking, and so that's the idea that, um, you know, you, you don't buy servers with an, OS, with, you know, an OS on them anymore, right? You no longer buy a Spark server with, with Solaris, right? You, you, you buy an HP server running RHEL, or you buy a Dell server running, you know, Windows, right? But in networking, it's still kind of, common to buy everything together in an appliance, right? You go buy your Cisco switch and it comes with a Cisco OS, and, and if that's not working for you, well, you're just kind of out of luck. Um, so the idea of uh, open networking is to decouple that hardware from the software. Um, so, you know, unlike NX OS that only runs on Cisco switches, Cumulus Linux runs on switches from uh, seven different hardware makers, and each one has a wide uh, variety of different kind of uh, switch designs, so you can pick one that really you know, does exactly what you need from the kind of vendor you want. Maybe, you know, you want global reach from a large uh, OEM, but maybe you are building a large-scale data center and maybe you're okay with a kind of smaller ODM because you get, you know, more appropriate pricing or, or whatever. Um, so, you know, it provides that flexibility. And the other, uh, the other kind of difference from what you may be used to in uh, more traditional 
uh, uh, switches is that it really is just Linux. You know, almost all network OSs today have a Linux kernel in them, but you, you would never know it, right? Like you SSH in and you get some proprietary CLI. And it has a config file that has some knobs you can turn, but you can't easily load your own software on it. You can't, you know, use uh, open source tools on it. Um, the interaction through it is either through a CLI or some sort of proprietary to that switch uh, API, if they give you one. So beyond that, you know, it is a switch, right? It does VLANs, VXLANs, you know, bridges, uh, routing, you know, protocols, you know, all the kind of normal stuff you'd expect. So you don't have to learn some new protocol like, you know, OpenFlow to manage this. Like all the, all the concepts you already know from networking still apply. It's just with a slightly different interface to it. So there's a lot going on in this diagram, so I'll, uh, I'll try to break it down. But so Paul talked about kind of the locality and the, the tension between wanting the replicas to be distributed uh, widely across the data center, across the different racks, so that you know if you lose an entire rack, you don't lose multiple copies. But at the same time, you want the data to be co-located close to each other for writes, so you don't have to replicate across a huge uh, a huge distance and also to the consumers of it, so they don't have to go talk to some server that you know, is in, uh, has very low bandwidth to it because it's far away. And so to facilitate that, we use a topology called a fat tree. Uh, it has some other names as well, but the basic idea is, unlike your kind of traditional network where you have a pair of core switches and then you know, top of rack switches connecting up to it uh, with oversubscription through the core, we have a larger number of small spine switches uh, usually in a, in a full mesh topology, you would have half as many spine switches as you have uh, top of rack switches. And the interesting property that that topology gives you is one, the, the techie term is full bisection bandwidth, but what it essentially means is you have the same amount of bandwidth to a server 10 racks over as you do to the server directly below you in the same rack. So now you no longer have to think about, you know, the network location of a server or a disk because they're all the same. And so that allows us to resolve the tension between wanting locality but also wanting distribution by removing locality as a constraint so then we can focus just on distribution, right? There's no longer any tension between the two. So the way we realize this is through building an IP fabric, a layer three fabric, usually with protocols like OSPF or BGP, um, typically these days eBGP. Um, and if you're familiar with networking, you may be thinking, well, you know, I mean, technically, I could do that with any switch. But as a practical matter, we've done some things that make this far easier and far more practical, both technical, for technical reasons and for non-technical reasons. Um, the first is that that open supply chain means you're no longer paying, you know, obscene prices for your, your switches. You can shop around and, and you know, get a reasonable uh, price, which means you can afford to have a lot more switches, right? What enables this extreme amount of bandwidth is the fact that you just physically have more switches. So you have more capacity. And the other thing, the other problem, challenge you might run into is then, you know, if we have more switches to get this more bandwidth, you have to manage these more switches, right? So, like, if you have your traditional switch, you'd have to SSH into each one and you know, upload a config file or build some tool that, you know, kind of manages templates and blows them out to various uh, uh, switches, you know, over SSH pretending to be, you know, a, a human, right? Um, and so we'll get into kind of how we can help out with that with automation tools in a, in a second. Um, and then the... Uh, the third is that um, you know, we, we've implemented some technologies that make this a little easier. I don't want to get too far into the gory details. I'll be getting into like, config files and, and the real gory details on Thursday in a different talk. So if, if you want to see that, you come, come for that one. But uh, the basic idea is instead of having to manage a huge number of IP addresses for all these little links, we give you the ability to assign one IP address to each switch and have that be the entire config. And so this makes it super easy to write a sing single, you know, config, usually about that long, that you can then just blow out across all of the, uh, um, all of the switches. And the final thing um, that's kind of cool here, and this is uh, maybe hard to see, so you can see the 1.1.1.1 IP address floating around. So in this model, that's the connector um, service that Paul was talking about, and this is kind of what the client interacts with, and then it in turn goes and talks to all the storage servers. And so you want you know, several of these for um, availability and for distributing load. And so what we've done here is we've con configured something called AnyCast. And the idea is, since we're using a routed network here, all of those con uh, connector nodes can announce a IP address into the fabric. 
And so that way, anytime someone asks for that IP address of, that, of the connector, they get routed to the closest one automatically by the network. And if that fails, they will be routed to a different one. And so we implemented some technology around that. You know, this is not a trick we invented, right? Other people have done this in the past. But it, in the past, has had a problem, which is that the flows are distributed to all these servers based on a hash of the source IP, dest IP, source port, dest port. Um, and some other stuff as well. But the problem with that is if one of these fails, you know, you were hashing across four servers. This hash function is stateless. It doesn't know which flows are going to which servers. So if one of those fails and now you're talking to three, all those flows get redistributed at random to all the servers. And so if these are TCP flows, which they are in this case, that causes broken connections. So what we did is implemented something we call resilient hashing. And so the way this works is if you have those same four servers, if one of them fails, only the traffic going to the, that failed server is redistributed to the three remaining servers. And so that way, only the traffic that was going to be broken anyway because it was going to a server that failed is affected by the outage. Okay, so, you know, we were talking earlier about kind of the, the config management challenge of all of these uh, large number of switches. So, you know, if you talk about a big deployment and you've got, you know, hundreds of switches, that number is fairly small, actually, compared to the number of servers you probably have, because you probably have thousands of servers. So in terms of managing things, we should look to how people manage a very large number of servers to draw lessons that we can then apply to managing large but smaller numbers of, of switches. And so in this case, instead of learning lessons, we just wholesale stole the technologies people had developed and open sourced for this. And so there's lots of great tools out there, you know, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, um, SaltStack, there, there are more. And, you know, people roll their own. And because all of these speak and are designed to deal with the common language of Linux, you know, the Linux commands, Linux APIs, we can just reuse them. We don't have to port them. We don't have to, you know, do anything. In fact, when we were a very small company, often we found out that one of these tools worked on our switch because one of our customers just did it, right? They downloaded it, installed it, and said, hey, it works great. Um, and similarly, you know, they're monitoring tools, you know, ClickD, Graphite, Nagios, all of these tools that have been used for, you know, years, decades even in some cases, on servers are now applicable to switches. And, you know, I don't know how many people here have used SNMP, but all of these tools are a huge improvement on SNMP. Um, and I think that's it. We wanted to throw it open for uh, questions. Yeah, and I'd just add that uh, the level of scale that we're starting to see for managing some of these large clusters starts ranging into hundreds of servers, thousands of disk drives, so certainly the, the collection of statistics and logs is becoming a, a problem at another level of magnitude. So embracing things like Elasticsearch and Logstash, uh, that seems to be kind of the paradigm that uh, users want us to take. Uh, so that's, that's the technology that we're starting to embed. So it's a very open approach. Uh, we actually use SaltStack, Chef, Puppet for, for deployment. Um, but you can see that sort of the synergy starts getting created when you uh, put multiple technologies together that work this way. So. We'd be happy to take any comments, any feedback from the audience, or? Okay. Question? Uh, I mean, I guess you're trying to maintain TCP continuity behind something that runs a traditional file server protocol, like Yeah, so, so the question was, are we trying to maintain state, network state behind something like file services, right? So I think the networking technology that we're talking about here is both the back-end fabric and the front-end. If you're talking about front-end connectivity to something like an NFS server, um, the technology that you use could certainly could be applied here, right, the, the technology that you discussed. Uh, but really what we're talking about is sort of simplifying the back-end fabric, right, the management of these large topologies that glue together <coughs> hundreds of storage servers and, and lots of protocol servers. So, so for that problem, you're going to run redundant network servers and you're going to do failover, right? Yes. So you're going to have standard technologies that do load balancing and failover on the front end servers. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're talking about Anycast earlier, the idea there is, you know, if I'm a client, I would connect to a single one of these connectors. If it fails, I would then have to reconnect. But, you know, most storage protocols expect to be able to reconnect and then reissue the, the pending I.O. So it, it is kind of designed to, to handle transient failures. 
right? So it, it doesn't change the nature of NFS retries and timeouts in that respect, but there are stateless protocols now like REST, which you can just na naturally load balance yeah. and uh, retry across. And the great thing about stateless protocols like that is then, you know, with any cast trick, you know, it's active, active, active across all the, all the nodes, all the servers, right? So you just kind of get connected to whichever one happens to be closest. So if the clients are evenly distributed, then the load gets evenly distributed across all of them. Right, so if you have an S3 protocol server or a Swift protocol server, you can run you know, a dozen of them, access any resource from any of them, and if one of them fails, uh, there's no, uh, no interruption to the service. Yeah, and convergence is sub-second. Well, I mean, on the back end, the, the storage software is aware of the multiple replicas, so it takes care of that. It's, it's the clients that may not be aware. They think they're talking to a single service endpoint, and so that's where the kind of cluster comes in and hiding the cluster behind a single IP address and kind of trying to load balance the, the traffic between, or the, the connections between these various and, service And we'll endpoints. provide back end redundancy with multiple paths to the different nodes. If there's a failure of a node, there's somebody else that can take over for that. So all of that's sort of built into the SDS layer. Okay, anybody else? All right, so Nolan and I will stick around. If you have any questions for us more more one-on-one, -on -one, please uh, come up and chat with us. And uh, we have a booth as well on the show floor. I'm not sure if Cumulus yeah. does, so uh, there's lots of access to us. Uh, there's also a paper available for download on the Scalarity website, as you see here on this URL, that talks about kind of the nature of the just discussion we had here, a little bit more detail on some of uh, the underlying technologies. So thanks very much for uh, your attendance. Thank you.